In this talk, we'd like to present a systematic review of 25 years of research using complex dynamic systems theory in language learning. For all three of us, it's clear that if theories such as complex dynamic systems theory are to avoid becoming academic fads or passing bandwagons, they need to contribute something of substance, something new and worthwhile that pushes the field forward. So since nearly three decades have passed, since CDST was introduced to the field, it seems necessary and appropriate to take stock of work using this theory. What's interesting to us is that the uptake of complexity theory in applied linguistics research has continued to accelerate pushing further and faster even than related fields such as education or theoretical linguistics. And recent syntheses of strands of applied linguistics research that are informed by complexity theory show that it's made important contributions to these strands of research. So considering this mainstream interest in complexity theory in the field, it seems appropriate and necessary to assess this body of empirical work and evaluate the strength of its contribution to the field. With that brief background, let me introduce the questions we were interested in answering through this systematic review. First, we were interested in looking back at the methodological characteristics of previous complexity studies in the field. We wanted to note trends and tendencies in these different design characteristics. Second, we were interested in the substantive contributions that this body of studies had made to the field and what evidence it had provided for specific domains of study. Finally, we wanted to explore if there were any limitations or potential areas for improving study quality in this domain. So we conducted an initial search for studies spanning a 25 year period. 1994 marks the date of the very first contribution on this topic a conference paper delivered by Diane Larson Freeman at the Second Language Research Forum. Our scope covered peer-reviewed articles, book chapters, conference papers, and doctoral dissertations. We conducted our search in databases in the field, including ERIC, MLA, ProQuest, and PsycInfo. You can see in the box our search terms, and we specified where these search terms should appear, either in the abstract or the main text, to avoid false negatives that are likely when searching with generic terms such as complexity. We supplemented this search with a Google Scholar search and an Ancestry search to ensure saturation. To further refine the 2,341 reports that this search returned, we applied our inclusion criteria for the systematic review. In order to be eligible for inclusion, the report had to satisfy the following criteria. Now, during this filtering, we eliminated more than 70 methodological and conceptual articles. By themselves, these are a testament to the robustness of the topical area in the field. We also included terminological antecedents to CDST, including DST, dynamic systems theory, and chaos theory. Based on our inclusion criteria, we narrowed it down to 488 reports, and there were no proceedings, conference papers, or book chapters that met all our inclusion criteria, but there were quite a few dissertations in this pool. After all three of us inspected these reports against the inclusion criteria, we decided to retain 158 unique reports for coding. Each of us coded a third of this pool, and to validate these judgments, a team of two trained coders independently coded 30% of all reports. And together, we examined the entire coding scheme and worked out discrepancies through discussion until agreement was reached. Starting with the characteristics of participants in this pool of studies, we can see that although a handful of studies included larger samples, Roughly 40% of all studies featured a sample size of 10 or less. And when combined with several other design characteristics, this highlights the increasing importance of individual-based and ideographic research. 
and within this pool, studies with younger participants were clearly in the minority. 112 studies sampled university students or adult language learners, and the rarest were studies with participants aged seven and younger. Since complexity theory is a relational, contextual perspective, we expected adequate depth of contextual detail to feature in the studies we reviewed. This table shows a wide range of research contexts were represented in the study pool, with foreign and second language learning contexts accounting for almost 84% of the total. Various instructional settings were also part of this pool. In addition to the 79 studies that took place in conventional instructed language settings, a handful of studies were conducted in online, immersion environments, and study abroad contexts. Considering the importance of context in complexity theory research, the number of studies left unspecified, either the research context or the instructional setting, was puzzling, and we return to this point in our discussion. Participants also represented various L1 backgrounds and target second languages. Among these, what stands out is the dominance of L2 English as a target language. It accounted for nearly 70% of studies in this pool. Turning to study design characteristics, we looked at the general approach to study design and the time scale of data collection. Over a third of studies were cross-sectional, and more than 58% of studies were longitudinal in design. In relation to the field more generally, this seems to be a, a higher proportion of longitudinal studies. Looking at study length, data elicitation took place most often over a time span of months, followed by studies with a time span of weeks, years, hours, and days. Study length in this pool ranged from 90 minutes to four years, but note that these numbers don't refer to the frequency of data elicitation, but the duration of the study itself. So more often than not, the details regarding the frequency of data sampling were not specified in the studies. It made it difficult to determine, for instance, if studies with a time span measured in weeks elicited data daily or twice at the beginning and end of the period or only once per, per participant over the course of study. With reference to the framework for method integration, we can see that over 80% of studies were exploratory and only 28 studies had a hypothesis testing objective and no study combined these two aims. Note that we coded these notions, whether a study was confirmatory or exploratory, from the research objectives formulated by the studies and not by examining claims made by the authors that their data confirmed or supported certain conclusions. The choice of unit of analysis was also fairly straightforward for many studies in this pool. The unit of analysis in 73 studies was the group, and in 70 studies, it was the individual. There were five studies in this pool that included more than one unit of analysis. Now, this is a very small subset of studies, but they illustrate the extent to which relying exclusively on group level data may impoverish the field's understanding of various phenomena. Choice of method was split across qualitative and quantitative studies and here we adopted an inclusive definition of methodology related to the purpose, the focus, the design, and procedures of studies in the report pool. The large number of purely qualitative studies is intriguing and seems to reflect the general tendency for newcomers to complexity theory to apply methods that capture rich, dense data sets. And this is borne out in our data. Roughly 80% of dissertations in this pool draw heavily on qualitative designs. Now, our review in no way suggests that exclusive qualitative methods are poorly suited to studying complexity and change, but we did find particular limitations in this pool of studies. Two of these relate to collecting data and adopting analytical techniques that don't lend themselves to investigating connections in context or dynamic change. Closely related to the design decisions are the choices of data elicitation and data analysis. We found that a range of conventional and widely used techniques were present in the reviewed studies. Now what's notable is that the majority of studies in this report pool included multiple complementary data sources. Studies included at least two, but often up to four data sources in combination. 
and these were distributed across all years of publication, this may reflect a general tendency to approach data collection in complexity theory research with a more is more mentality, because everything counts, everything's connected, and everything changes. Study design may have followed the premise that more data is more appropriate to fully examine these phenomena. Now recall that in addition to methodological characteristics of these studies, we were interested in determining what substantive contributions this pool of studies has made to the field. We looked at contributions in two broad areas, empirical or theoretical contributions and practical contributions. Now empirical or theoretical contributions were demonstrated in a variety of areas. Two of the most noticeable were evidence supporting the claim that the phenomena or constructs under study were complex and dynamic. Other notable contributions include evidence of the influence of context in development, or the nonlinearity of development, or the presence of nonlinear predictors or emergent outcomes and patterns. Other contributions involve studies that show evidence of inter and intra individual variability. And many of these contributions, as you see, are distinguishing features of complexity theory that other theories don't account for or even investigate. We were also interested in what practical contributions complexity theory studies have made to the field. These contributions are sought after by many, and perceptions that these applications are not readily available can act as a curb on wider uptake of complexity theory in the field. Now, as this table shows, the practical contributions were not few in number, and they ranged from direct pedagogical insights to fuller, more multidimensional understanding of prevalent issues in the field and even to the explanatory power of contextual factors in development. Other practical contributions relate closely to applications for research across these topics. This includes studies that helped uncover new insights into phenomena under investigation, studies that shift attention to new aspects of existing phenomena, or that show limitations of existing methodological perspectives. Our third and final aim relates to methodological rigor and what areas, if any, were apparent for improving the quality of research going forward. And some of the most prevalent design issues we identified were related to data or analyses that were seemingly inappropriate for investigating change and development, or unfortunately studies relying on data and analyses that were poorly suited to studying connections in context. For example, it's not hard to appreciate why studies drawing on a single round of interviews or cross-sectional test data at one or two time points would struggle to shed any light on complex connections in context or dynamic change. So to recap, our systematic review looked at the methodological characteristics of complexity theory research and the contributions this body of research has made to the field, and finally at study quality. Our research points to clear trends shows that first, the field has made strong advances in describing complex systems and identifying various dynamic changes. These are core objectives of complexity theory research in applied linguistics. It's also clear from our review that the field has begun to work on another objective, that is modeling complex mechanisms and dynamic patterns using innovative methods for data collection and analysis. Now, as applied social scientists, applied linguistics aims to go further than mere description and enact certain forms of practice in social contexts. So as a consequence, over two and a half decades of thinking and research in complexity theory, continued work with descriptive findings that are limited to descriptive insights are unlikely to push the field forward in a substantive way at this stage. What still remains to be done is to understand how to intervene or influence systems behavior. To conclude, we'd like to synthesize the methodological lessons we got from this review, and we refer to them here as tenets. Now, the table on this slide and the next slide synthesize these and show these tenets in relation to an individual study or a program of research. Briefly, for individual studies informed by complexity theory, our systematic review suggests that studies should provide a rationale for adopting complexity theory in the first place. In addition, they should articulate how complexity theory informs the design and methods. Studies should specify the aims, units of analysis, 
and the outcomes or processes under investigation. Form should follow function, and studies should adopt methods of data elicitation and analysis that are driven by these aims, units of analysis, and outcomes under investigation. Finally, studies informed by complexity theory should specify the role of particular contextual factors in the processes under investigation. Going forward, programs of research informed by complexity theory should identify areas for complex interventions to allow researchers to focus on influencing and intervening in systems change. It should also develop criteria for designing and evaluating these systems interventions. Additionally, programs of research should adopt more integrated designs that integrate exploratory and falsificatory aims, individual and group level analyses, and mixed methods.